what uh Hey guys, what's up? Thought I go live today. See if anybody's gonna come in and get this notification. Mm -mm -mm. Hey Fosdo. How you doing, man? First person, you get the first comment. Fausto, is that how you pronounce it? Fausto? So I wanted to um, go live really quick, answer some questions. I know. Hey, Gary. Hey, bud. I was going to go live at 6 p.m. Jumped on a little early. I think I see a... What's up, Rob? Uh, I know I normally go live at 6 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time on Tuesdays. Today, I'm going a little early because there's something going on at 6.30 that I probably want to attend. So I thought I'd jump on a little bit and see how everybody's going. Hey, Chase. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for the hundred K. Yeah, I'm still waiting for um, still waiting for YouTube. Uh, I keep checking my my account. Apparently, they have to hit me up and to get my little plaque. I'm gonna put it right. Where is it? Right here. Right somewhere on the wall there. And when I get my little plaque, that will be pretty cool. So I'm waiting for that. Um, yeah, Gary. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Staying cool in Santa Monica, um, but I was gonna uh, I'm gonna jump on live and I was gonna share my um, share my screen and just talk a little bit about um, just some interviewing tips. Um, this week is I'm gonna be uh, there's a friend of mine who's doing an interview or he's <clears throat> he's interviewing someone. Appreciate it, Rob. He's interviewing someone. Um, in regards to helping people, helping designers, or helping anybody in tech um, get hired faster, he's interviewing someone at this company called Crash, or it's called Crash.co, Crash.co. So um, um, it's a it's an app that allows you to, or it's a company that basically helps you create or make your resume a little bit more interactive, which was kind of cool. So. Um, so this this what I wanted to do is jump on and just really talk about um, interviewing. I want to talk about a couple of things, and I want to talk about interviewing. Let me grab my pen, and um, I want to give you a few tips for like when you're going into an interview, um, just some things to think about. Um, number one, I always talk about always have. I think when you go into an interview, or let me just say. When you go into an interview, there's a lot of times you can kind of you can over prepare or you can prepare or you can kind of confuse yourself. When you go into a job interview, obviously the phone call is the first thing you always have with the recruiter, and then you have an official, let's just say the official interview, the one hour interview with someone, right? It's gonna be could be the hiring manager, and then once that person fills you out, you'll have another interview. Um, with uh, maybe somebody on the team or somebody from the organization. But basically, once you get past the, the initial interview, the, the other interview should be, should be pretty good. But the thing that I like to say is um, when you go into an interview, I don't think you should over-prepare because you never know where the interview is going to go. Um, so, for example, I always like to go into the interview with just three strong things and then from a from a product designer standpoint really try to focus on the four the four key um 
points that I always touch on, but let me just talk about this really quick. So I always say go in with, with three, three strong points. I will say three strong points of value. So for example, I could go into an interview and say number one, and I talked about this before, is that number one, I, I'm at some point in the interview, and here's my here's my reasoning for, for going in with three strong points, because sometimes you go into an interview and you guys could go off on a tangent. Like one time I went into an interview and we were just talking about Lakers basketball. So if I had prepared for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours for this interview, we went on and started talking about Lakers basketball. At that point, it was just a casual conversation, you know, to be honest with you. And um, it just really, you know, it's really just, it gets casual at that point. You know, always be, be yourself. But going with three strong points of value in terms of what you could bring to the organization. Um, so for, for example, number one, I always say, I'm, I'm, I'm basically, I'm an expert in getting things done, right? Getting things done is one, meaning that, and the, re the reason why I like to bring that up is because it's, it's a valuable asset, meaning like if you're somebody who, um, no matter what it takes, if I have to work weekends, right, it's, it's, I don't have to say it. I, I just, I'll get things done. We have a deadline coming up in two months. I'm going to do whatever I can to stay late, work with uh, the developers, you know, build, a, build relationships, design do as do you know have many stakeholder reviews whatever it takes to to get things done to really to work with integrity to, to ship products that's what i try to bring to the table and then number two i always say i'm a, I'm a strong problem solver now that could that could be applied to just that could be applied to ux that could be obviously we can break that down into my problem solving steps into solving for the products but in, in in a sense being a strong problem solver is can be beneficial in many different ways you could be solving problems communication conflicts within an organization you know or you know with within within different groups development groups ux groups you know um and things like that and um <laughs> lakers yeah game three is today at 6 p.m now um, <laughs> um, but, um, so the, the problem solving thing is something else that's, that's very strong. So when I come in and say, Hey, my, my three strengths, my values, you know, my three strengths that I could bring to this organization, I just get, I get things done, you know, no matter what it takes, I can get things done. Number two, I'm an excellent problem solver. I love to think through problems, whether it's for designs, whether it's for, um, the, the, you know, improving our process improving our design process, improving our product development process, working with others and getting things done, right? So problem solving, and then third one is, is kind of like a playoff that problem solving is communication. And and basically is, and to actually, or I could say my my value is communication, but basically basically building relationships. And I, these two, as when you guys hear me talk a lot about my, my, the three critical strengths to a product designer, these two are obviously part of that, that, that group, that four group, uh, whereas one is visual design, um, but uh, critical thinking. But the reason why I don't, I don't necessarily bring visual design up when I talk about my key strengths in an interview, I'll tell you why, because Ultimately, when I got the interview, when they looked at my portfolio, they already know that I can design, okay? Now it's like, what else can we do? We know you're a good designer. That's why we brought you in, right? So you can visual design. What what really make, what really truly makes you a valuable asset, right? Because, yeah, you can design, but a lot of other people can design, but that's not really why we brought you in. Yeah, that's part of it, but ultimately, what, can, what value can you provide to this company and those are the type of things that I always go into with three strengths getting things done problem solver and my ability to build relationships my ability to communicate and when I say communicate it's communicating with devs building relationships with devs POs and stakeholders because if you if you can build relationships with this group here 
you'd be a valuable asset to any organization. So I think when I go into an interview, I kind of go into it with these three things that I want to, like at, at some point when they ask me a question, I might hit them with, you know, I'm, I'm great at, you know, I, I, I rely on my three strengths, you know, be able to get things done, problem solve. And then I can dive deeper. If they're kind of like nodding their head and they're kind of like, um, it, that's interesting. Can you go further on that? Then I can go further on what I mean by problem solving. I can go further on what I mean by communication and, and the importance of that. And I can go further in getting things done because um, uh, in all the jobs that I've been at, it's critical. If, if you can get things done, if I can work weekends, there's never been a situation in my 20 years in my career where I didn't deliver screens, right? It's not that I, I stopped working at 4 p.m. or 5 p.m. that day. I'm like, sorry, man, you know, I, I'm going, I'm going, I have my weekends coming up. No, if they needed screens to get done, I would work on those screens at night. I would work on those screens on Sunday. They would even see me in the chat on Sunday, Sunday nights, you know, and so I'm always able to get stuff done. So they, the company could always rely on me as an asset to the company to deliver, right? And so that's something that you definitely want to go into, um, to, uh, your interviews with and really letting them know that you're a strong asset. Um, let me stop right here and, and, and look at the screen and see if I can take some colors. Um, yeah, this uh, somebody's asking, uh, will this um, broadcast be live? I am, I'm gonna post this. Um, um, oh, so uh, I am gonna post this. This will be live on YouTube. This gets posted automatically on YouTube. And I do have a replay for the Thursday. Somebody was asking me for the Thursday um, meetup that I had last week, which was a good one. I did record it. It's uploaded on YouTube. I'm going to post it there. And then uh, I'm going to post that one live as well. So you guys will be able to see that. That one's like an hour and a half of me answering questions. So that's, um, I think uh, that will be interesting for you guys as well. Um, let me read a couple of these questions. Uh, let me see. David says, um, great points, Mike. Are there any tips and books you recommend to improve communication? That's a great question. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, I, to be honest with you, I, that's a really good question because I never really read or learned anything about communication. I just realized the importance of it. Um, and I personally was, is, I'm always a nice person. So I think that the best way to approach communicating with another developer or another person in your organization is really to be nice. And I think you can get very technical. There's, I'm sure there's a lot of books like listening is a big one, you know, just going in and really just listening when you're in, um, and when you're, when you're meeting with somebody one-on-one -on -one or you're being considerate of their views, I think that's, that's huge. Um, so I would say just keep it simple, right? Listen, be considerate of their opinions and their, what they're telling you. And then if you really like, obviously the good book is when, uh, what is it? Winning friends and influencing people, influencing people, winning friends by, I don't know who that's by, but, um, that's a, a great book, but one of the one of the points in that book, um, um, yeah, how to win friends and influence people. Um, thanks, Rebecca. Um, one of the yeah by Dale Carnegie, but one of the key principles in that book is listening and basically letting others, like basically just letting them feel like their point is valid or their point, their what they're trying to say is important. And I think that's huge. Those are just common sense principles that if you set, if you sat and you listened to somebody and you just kind of listened and you kind of, um, didn't really try to push your views down someone's throat, that's, you can win friends all day. Like, um, I always talk about, I have a group of friends. Um, I have a group of like six friends, six guys, and there's one friend, his name is Fabian. Fabian is so confident. He's like super like buff and all this stuff, but he just sits back and anything that I've, I've known this guy for 20 years, anything that I've kind of come out and just talked about, man, I want to do this, this, this. He just he just smiled and encouraged like, Mike, that's awesome, man. And, and, and when I look back at all my friends, it's this one friend that I feel this one guy just always listened. He always didn't didn't really add too much. 
of his, his you know, he didn't conflict, conflict with me and he just listened. He was just a nice person. And it's like, so I always want that person around me. You know, so if you can apply those principles into the communication when I'm talking with developers and I know for sure when I talk with developers, I have my, um, my thing is I always build strong relationship with developers. You know, it's like, I always try to have them meet me halfway. And, um, so I always like, I give my points and then I always try to have them, I encourage them to give me their input and we try to work together to build those products. And um, when I do that, you know, developers, they, they love me, they love working with me, you know, but if I'm coming in there and like, Hey, I'm the UX designer, this is what I think, you know, because I did the research and this is how it should be. There's going to be a conflict, you know, and then same with the product owners or the stakeholders, you're going to get a, a lot of, a lot of people that, um, have strong views, but if you just basically just respect their views and try to work with them with their views, they're going to love you. And then, you know, they're going to, um, you know, they're going to want you on their team. But if you're conflicting, if you're like, Hey, that, 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 that idea is dumb. I don't know about that or this and that, then guess what? It's going to just be like oil and water. You guys aren't going to, um, you know, um, you're not going to work out. And I was just talking to somebody just now in a one-on-one, -on -one, I was telling them like communication is huge. So that's why I wanted to touch on this point. Um, let me just get back to my screen. That the communication part is in my 20 years in any company, I realized that communication, like there's conflict between the development group, the, the UX group, the marketing group, the sales group. There's always conflict. There's always conflict because the VPs of those organizations, they want, they all want their cake, right? They want their piece of the pie. So they want to, they want to, they want to look good to the CEO of that organization. So they're always trying to get their, their things done. You know, I know, I remember at ADP product, the VP of product was always conflicting with the VP of UX design and uh, the VP of product always wanted to move faster. UX design always wanted to spend time researching people and doing different things. And uh, there was just a lot of conflict. So if you can sit at the lunch table and just kind of like talk things out, that's a huge asset to any, any organization. So I think that's, that's always key to bring those up. Um, let me look through some of these questions. Guess some of these earlier questions. <clears throat> what do you think about it? So Ralph says right here, it says, what do you think about doing personal projects to improve a certain part of a website? It's focusing on aspect of the flow of a good idea. Yeah, so um, yeah, definitely. That's a really that's a really good idea. Like taking parts of a website, like parts of they say Netflix, and you wanted to add to something and you you thought it'd be great to add to let's say a Netflix or an Amazon or any type of any popular website facebook or instagram or twitter or youtube and that's always that's always dope so that's always great ideas for personal projects what if uh, let's see so gary says what if what if some people are talking nonstop and literally never saw <laughs> Well, they're, if you stop, if, if someone's talking nonstop and you're just listening, they're going to feel awkward at some point. About 10 minutes in and you haven't said a word, they're going to stop. So that's the truth about that. So Zach says, um, any thoughts on finding entry level position during this pandemic? Um, great question. Um, you know, obviously keep applying. I was just uh, speaking to somebody who, um, was saying something who said something very smart and when you're when you're going to these sites you know linkedin's the glass doors or whatever try to do the easy applies first like if you can just always do easy apply like try to hit up like 10 to 20 of those at whatever um and then spend go go into the specific jobs that don't have the easy apply to try to you know spend 45 minutes applying to those but um entry-level job um i think 
I don't know if you can verbally or however you want to say it, announce yourself as someone that just wants an entry level. I still think you apply to those entry level jobs because people like me, I don't apply to entry level jobs, right? You just look and see and find them. And any job that's like, you know, beginning level, um, you know, junior, just apply to them. And then don't, this is what I, this is what I say. Don't um, call yourself junior. Okay. If you are a junior designer, don't call yourself junior because I think it, it, you're, you're, you're apologizing for not being ex experienced. And I don't think we have to do that. Just call yourself a UX designer, you know, a product designer. And um, during the conversations, if you have one year or six months of experience, the interviewer um, will know just by looking at your resume and, and stuff like that. That will be determined by the other person, especially through communication. And I think um, regardless of your skill set, if you have a strong portfolio, I think that's beside the point. So you can have six months worth of experience um, going out for a job, but if you have a strong portfolio, that tells me like, I, I love your portfolio. I don't care if you didn't really work. I know you're coming in at a junior level um, because you applied to, for this job and I'm telling you how much we can afford and you're going to say yes or no to that price. Like if I, if I, if I'm looking for somebody and I'm bringing somebody in and I only have, <clears throat> Thirty thousand dollars for the you know as, as my budget. Um, if that's good for you, or if you're someone that is interested in that level, you're gonna you know respond you know accordingly. But you don't have to say, hey, I'm I'm, I'm junior level. Just say you're a product designer, you know. Um, and also also think of it like this. Like I always talk about it. Your your portfolio is your golden ticket. Your portfolio is your ticket into any company, any company, right? So when you say is there any advice to getting an entry level job or any job is to work on your portfolio, work on your portfolio. All of us, everybody watching this, myself included, anybody that's watching this, we always can improve on our portfolio. The more we improve on our portfolio, the better our chances in that recruiter, that hiring manager wanting to interview you. So let me see. Let's see what about transitioning from one field to another here's another question Jen says what what about someone transitioning from another field um, what are with a design degree but no portfolio yet um, yeah you can have a so for if you're if you're transferring from another industry like discipline but you have a design degree no portfolio yet you got to work on your portfolio no ifs ands or buts um, you've already have the degree which is going to look great you already have some experience. You already have a lot of stuff that someone like myself never had. Um, so unfortunate, but, but we all have to work on our portfolio. Your portfolio is your golden ticket. Your portfolio is your golden ticket. Let me, let me see if I could find that. Um, hold on. Let me see if I can find Willy Wonka. Willy Wonka. Remember this film? Classic. Where's the golden ticket? I like to use this analogy. Right there. See this ticket? Golden ticket in the chocolate bar. That's what I like to say. Your your res your your portfolio is the ticket. The the candy factory that this little kid and everybody else who got this golden ticket. Your portfolio is that golden ticket. That's what's going to get you into the interview. And um, like my friend like to say, the soft skills and stuff like that, that I always talk about, like the soft skills is what's going to land you the job and keep you there. So honestly, obviously, that's what one of these, one of the topics of this, this, um, this, this, this video today was really talking about like the soft skills, like interviewing and the stuff that you can say that's going to help you out in the interview, but your portfolio is what's going to get you there because, um, and so, so think of it like this, if you have the golden ticket, 
your por- that means your portfolio is amazing. Like think about it. If your portfolio is amazing, and you it, consider that your golden ticket, when you get that interview, you're gonna have that call with. You're gonna have a call with the recruiter. You're going to have then that recruiter is gonna love you, right? Your your soft skills are gonna get you to the next level. Then you're gonna have a call with the hiring manager. Now that one call, that one hour call with the hiring manager. They're not really going to be, though they love, they like your interview. I mean, they like your portfolio per se, but that hiring manager really just want to chat with you. They really want to get to know you. They're not going to be going too deep into your portfolio. That hiring manager guarantee that hiring manager won't. They're going to really want to get to know you. Um, they were, they, if they, if they didn't want, if they saw your portfolio and they just realized from your portfolio, you didn't really have that the thing that they're looking for, they wouldn't, they would cancel the interview. You would even get a chance to get that interview. So you're gonna get a call with the hiring manager. Now it's the portfolio will be pushed aside. Now it's you just meshing well with that person. They want to see what type of person you are, you know, how you communicate, how you think, you know, just like if you're a cool person, like can I really hire this person? Like, what's your thoughts, you know? Um I was just talking to somebody else who loves to was talking. We were just talking about we had a one on one call and he's talking about how he loves to travel. And I'm like, think about it. If you went into a, a, a interview and you told me like, hey, I like to travel a lot. Like that's my that's my, my passion. I'm thinking like, how long is that person going to be at my job? Right. So I'm like, hey, make sure not to really go too deep. You know, you can touch on you travel the world and think, things like that. But don't touch on it like, hey, it's my goal to travel the world because I'm like, oh, this person's going to be gone in a year and a half, blah, 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 you know, so um, think of those things. Let me answer a few more. Um, yeah, um, so Zach was saying, um, appreciate it, Zach, you're welcome. He was saying, uh could be live portfolio reviews. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to do that more often. I'm definitely going to do that. I'm going to do live portfolio reviews. Um, um, definitely. Um, you know what the interesting thing about me and portfolios? Here, here's why I don't... Like, that used to be my deal, like reviewing portfolios. It used to be something that I always did or wanted to do as a YouTube thing. But... I'm really like beyond, I'm like beyond that point. And I'll tell you why. Because there's really someone like myself, I could see through, like, I know all of us as designers, we want to like, we work on our portfolio and we want to, you know, get get our, get people's opinions of our portfolio. But really, it's not really about the portfolio itself. Like, I know a lot of like top designers or top thought leaders try to do portfolio reviews and say, this is what I like. I would do this differently. But listen, at the end of the day, can you design? Like, do, like can I, I can look at your, your work for like a minute and, or, or I can look at your work for five seconds. And if I see something that just goes, ooh, that's it. I don't care about the portfolio itself. I don't care what your name is. I'm like, wow, can he design? Can this person design? And if I can see that, I'm like, they have something here, right? And now I want to talk to you. What your portfolio is, is and how you set it up and what you did and what colors you, you chose, as long as you keep it clean and you're, you know, it's classy and all that stuff. I don't, I don't, you know, so it's not. I am going to spend, I'll probably spend more time going through a bunch of different portfolios just to kind of just scan through things. But I'm sure you'll get a feel for like how I approach things. It's really not nitpicking at people's stuff. Like I seen some, like to be realistic, I seen some terrible designs, like some ter- terrible portfolios. But you know what that means to me is that this person is still learning how to design. And so my response to that person was like, not that your portfolio is nasty. It looks terrible. I'm like, I'm like totally honest. I'm just like saying, hey, the only thing, like you just need to work on your, your, your visual design. Just start there first and then we can clean up your portfolio later. But just spend tonight doing this particular task, you know, taking this one little screen and copying it. So when I look at, there's, there's no portfolio that you can throw my way that I would say, this is horrible. This is wrong. 
The only thing I would say in at a portfolio is obviously this person is still learning visual design. Two or one, this person has good visual design. They just need to like you know maybe um, show their face a little bit, maybe some personal branding, you know, stuff like that. You know, um, so those are the type of things I will I will touch on, but um, definitely gonna review some portfolios. Uh, Let's see this. Uh, tomorrow said, I'm trying to gain trust with the VP of development. <laughs> he only trusts a UX consultant hired before me, who is his personal friend. Uh, yep. Um, uh, there's a lot of politics in, 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 in corporations, and, and so it's definitely harsh. Let's have a portfolio piece for marketing. Let's see. Hillary says, must have a portfolio piece for marketing design. Question is, should you or do you um, for marketing design? I don't know, really know the extent of that question, but I would assume not yes or no, but I don't think it's a, a deal breaker in what you're asking. But um, if you're thinking about should you design something for marketing, yes, it's, it will only benefit you. Um, So I guess somebody was uh, was responding to that person about the marketing design. Um, so this person, Josh, was re replying to Hillary saying, "Beth, it depends on the marketing firm and the job." And then and they said, uh, "Skill set differences between UX and your firm." Okay, so you're asking like, what's the skill set differences between UX and UX design? Basically, the um, UX, so UI design is is actually the 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 skill of designing screens. Um, let me show. So it's it's, it's pretty simple, um, but it's complex because the world makes it complex. The UX industry makes it complex, but. UI is simply, UI basically is the visual design. Visual design of screens. And the UX is just the, um, the, the, the thinking part. Thinking and methods. You can say methods used to um, to create a good experience experience so for example designing screens let's look at let's look at um, dribble really quick um, I'll give you an example so the skill of designing these screens and I'm sure they're going to show and okay so the skill of designing a screen like this like doing the visuals like this nice background this layout this box here with the image in here this text this whole composition is UI design that's UI design that's the, the this person has the ability to do visual design the UX part of it is did this person accomplish or create a site or an application that allows um, that solves a problem for the user right so if the user came here and didn't know what to do and didn't know how to interact with this, um, that's that would be poor UX, right? If this person was um, designing something for someone, let me just get to another app. Yeah, so in short, UX is basically just the, the thinking through the, the designs and, and, and making sure that you're designing the great experiences for what's it, what's the app in, is intended for. That's what UX is, and so those are the, the two. They're all one and the same. Th these could uh, this basically sums up. In short, we could just say problem uh, product designer. So a product designer utilizes both these 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 things, both UI visual design 
and UX. They they think through their problems and they try to solve problems. They try to work with product owners. They work with stakeholders. They work with CEOs. They work with the customers. Listen to them, get their requirements, and try to design those screens. And so that all that combined is UI and UX. And so in the world today, um, in in our, in our world, we call it several things. We call it product designer. Um, we call it UI slash UX designer. They call it UX slash UI designer. They call it interaction designer, interaction designer. I know Google used to use that term a lot. They used to say interaction designer. Now they, I think they use product designer. Um, so there's five different, there's other ones. Like you even see it spelled out, user experience designer. So here's the, here's the, here's the truth. I have talked about this in the, in the past before. So all these names, all these words mean the same thing. There's really only two positions in this industry. Let me show you. There's only, there's the, the designer. There's a designer and over here you have the researcher. Okay. So in our industry, this is, this is 100% legit. In our industry, in the design industry, there's only two, there's only two positions. There's the designer and then there is the researcher. So for example, you can get hired at a company and you are only a researcher. So this is the person that, that does all the, the, you know, I mean, they do everything. They do everything. They, they try to, um, they do, they research, <laughs> they do surveys, they try to solve problems. They do interviews, they interview customers, interviews, they research the market. They analyze the market, analyze, they do all types of stuff. A UX, this is considered a UX researcher, right? They also, they, you know, they do the usability studies, usability studies. They, um, you know, they present um, ideas and direction that the company should, should, should follow. They, hold, they do a whole slew of things, right? They do a whole slew of things. And this person, what they don't do, this person over here, they design screens. They design screens. They problem solve as well. They critically think. And they work with, uh, you know, they work with developers, work with devs so this is the product designer there are only two positions there's this position here like i said there's five names for this there are five or six or seven or ten different names there's really only one name for a ux researcher and that's a ux researcher i have always been this over here I've always worked with UX researchers. Okay, so I've never been a UX researcher. Um, I never cared to be a UX researcher. I don't wanna just do research stuff. I like designing. I like presenting my screens. I like doing stuff. I like problem solving. I like doing a lot of things. So I don't, I don't, I don't do UX research stuff. I, I obviously know it. I've worked with UX researchers, but um, it's not the, it's not the fun part of the career for me, to be honest with you, it's not. And, um, you know, so you have a choice. You can go multiple routes in this, in this industry. You can go UX researcher route, um, or you can go the product designer route. I like the product designer route. Why? Because I think it's, um, I don't know, it's more, not that it's just more fun because you get to design. I think it's, it's, uh, more essential. Right. I mean, I don't have you don't have to um, don't shoot the messenger. 
But if we were, if you were, like I said, if you were starting a career, if you were starting a job today in a garage, if you were building an app, if we were building, let's say, Uber, I don't know, let's do TikTok. Let's TikTok. TikTok. Let's just look at some of these screens on TikTok. Uh, I can't find any. TikTok screens. Let me see. Screen shop. All right. If we were building, if you were in a garage and you were building, let me get to this. Open in the new tab. Come on. Okay. Here we are. If we were build, if, if I was in a garage and I was building, I wanted to build an app like this that was a competitor to TikTok. Like 100%, I'm just being honest. Would I need a UX researcher? No. But I need a designer, I need a developer, and I need a product leader who's going to market this. Okay, you need three people. Product leaders, biz, like smart like leaders, like whoever, like somebody will need to lead this product. You need a developer who knows how to code the back end and the front end. And you need, um, you need like a full stack developer, really. And then you need a designer who can do this UI and UX. Three people. Those are three essential skills, three essential careers that don't shoot the messenger. That's just common sense. So if, if you were to tell me, hey, you want to get started in this career and I want to be a UX researcher or product designer, I would tell you be, become a product designer because it's more essential, right? Um, that's just honest truth. Now, are there tons and tons of big tech companies hiring these folks? Of course, they're essential, all right? If the company needs has the resources to do that, they're essential in that aspect. They can grow they can they can analyze they can research the market and do diff different things and help this company makes make more money but when i'm just starting out i need three people if i'm again if i'm just doing this if i'm building an app out of my garage i need three people product designer full stack developer and product leader so those are um those are that's just you know those are uh that's how i that's kind of like how i think think through things Let me take a few more questions. This is cool. Um, I've heard the pros and cons of that. Let's see. David said, I heard the pros and cons of adding an about me page or portfolio website. What's your take on it? Um, I think about, about me pages are great because I can see a picture of you, maybe tell your story, show me some vacation photos. Awesome. I always like about me pages um i think are always great because i want to see um it's a personal branding thing right so if you have photos of you know post photos of your family you on vacation you at the you know you in china on the great wall of china or something like that traveling the world awesome it shows me a little bit more about you it's more personable so i love about me pages on portfolios I don't know what the cons are. The cons are, if the cons are that it was, uh, it's not designed well, I don't think an about me page would never, would never be a bad thing. Um, would never be a bad thing. I think about me pages are great. I used to have an about me page where it showed me and my family on, it showed my, my wife and my daughter in Hawaii. The other Photo was me on a jet ski in Hawaii because that's our favorite vacation spot. Another one was me and my, my wife and then me and my family. And so the it just kind of showed that I was a family guy, you know, because that's a big part of my life. And so just be yourself. Be real. I found out that user persona and your SME can be helpful as well in the gaming industry. Um, yeah, so Gabriel was saying any, you know, like some, any tips on initial interviews with recruiters? Um, yeah, so, uh, 
this one is just like the initial interviews with recruiters. Obviously, they're not going to go deep into, I think, deep into your portfolio. Some will probably. Um, but for the most part, if you just um, be yourself, you know, I think you, you, you approach you approach the recruiter interview um, just as you will approach the interview with the hiring manager. Um, um, but, you know, you can kind of be more casual, you can be more casual about the recruiter because the recruiter wants you to win. To be honest with you, think about this. When the recruiter gets you on the phone, they get you on the phone because they thought your resume, your portfolio was impressive. And they might even be giving you more tips. They might say, man, I really want to send you over to this company, but they really um, are interested in, um, you know, this type of stuff on your portfolio. So I just want to make sure you have that. Like recruiters are pretty helpful in the interviews. And it's really about you just hitting them with, you know, your strong points. You know, hey, I'm going to, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a product designer, a strong product designer. I have this much experience. I'm very strong in visual design and problem solving, critical thinking, you know, and, and building relationships with, with, with developers and things like that. And so that's my strong suit. And you just go from there. And when they want to talk to you about projects, it's just about casually talking with them about projects. But have your strong, have your strong, your strengths that you hit the recruiter with, and that should be enough. And once you, once they see that you can communicate well, and um, that you're confident, you know, be confident. They want to pass you on to the hiring manager because they want you to win. The recruiter is there. I'm sure they in-house recruiters get bonuses. Obviously, outside recruiters get the big bonus a commission package once you land that job. So they want you to win. Um, the recruiters are your friend. So it's just a matter. I think the most important thing about recruiters is is be confident. Um, be strong, be confident in your abilities and what you can bring to the organization. And, um, you know, just, just one time I had a, I had a, I had a recruiter hit me up and they were talking to me and I said this, I said, um, the recruiter goes, you know, I want to send this over to this company, to the hiring manager, but they really want, they really want, um, uh, designers to show this on their portfolio and it was like wireframes and flow charts and stuff that I really didn't have on my portfolio. I'm like, listen, give me, let me spend five minutes talking to that, whoever that hiring manager is, just give me five minutes with them. If, if they can't give me five minutes, then I don't want to work for them anyway. But after five minutes of talking with them, they would know that I know everything about product design. Right. So if they don't want to hire me because of something, trust me, I'm not. Yeah. But if I really if, if I if, if so, I'm always telling recruiters like, listen, just send me send me over, send my send my stuff over, um, have them talk to me. You know, once I get them on the phone, I'm pretty strong in, in what I know. And anybody can see that I, I know what I'm talking about. And um, so I kind of like. Sometimes have to nudge the recruiter, like, listen, stop, stop following these, the, the, this, this, this textbook stuff, you know, this ego driven gatekeeper stuff. You know, there's a lot of egos, ego, ego gatekeepers. Um, let me talk about that for a little bit. Let me show you guys another screen. All right. So, so. Here's the job, right? So you got a lot of like these 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 hiring managers here, they got egos. Egos. And what I mean by that is they go by they go by textbook theories um, they want you to have a degree. They want you to have, you know, human computer interaction stuff on your, you know, they, they basically all these, these gatekeepers here, before you can get to the job here, you got to go through these gatekeepers. Now over here, before you get to these gatekeepers, these are the recruiters. 
the recruiters are fine. They don't really hold you. They want you to win. So basically, when you when you when you speak with the recruiters here, um, before they send you over to these guys, they know these guys are. They want this stuff. They want. They want all the stuff, you know, and so they want they want you to have the user personas, the sticky notes, <laughs> all this garbage, you know. And so I've been in my I've been in the game so long. I've I've been over here, and so I kind of look and I see these guys. I'm like, why are they asking for this stuff? Why are they holding people accountable for this stuff? Why are they doing this? Why are they doing that? Why are they doing that? And that's where I come off with my different approach, my different take, and I call it ego driven. These are the gatekeepers right here. These are the gatekeepers. And so what happens is, unfortunately, in this in this industry, we have to battle and play the game of getting around ego driven gatekeepers. Um, you know, and sometimes you're going to get lucky where you have you're going to go through a slew of gatekeepers who are not ego driven. They are like, you know, they're like me. They're like, oh, they want you to win too. You know, because me, I can work with somebody who has the skills, who has the passion, who has the integrity, who has the commitment. I can work with them, you know, and they're a good designer. Obviously, if I'm hiring somebody who needs to be at a senior level of doing something, you're going to want to hire somebody who's strong in visual design. So you might take somebody who's a little bit better of a problem, a, a, a visual designer who can design really strong apps and who can communicate well and things like that. So those are some critical things, but I'm not going to hold you accountable for, for, for having things. I'm going to ask you about certain things, you know, uh, I know because here's what's the trip is when it gets to, when it gets to on the job stuff, like wireframes, sticky notes, user personas. I mean, come on. It's all overrated. I don't even use that stuff day to day. In all my 20 years in designing apps, working with developers, I never use, I mean, I, the several times when I try to do like a balsamic wireframe or a real wireframe, you know what my stakeholder said? My stakeholder would look at, look at my stuff and go, is when are we getting the real stuff? That's what they say. They, they want, they, they always say that. When are we getting the real stuff? Why are you showing me this? And then here I am as a designer. Well, I don't want you to get bogged down by the colors and the icons and the treatment and all that stuff. Like, okay, that's good, but um, I got to go. But let me know when you have those designs. Basically, that's 99% that's of the time I get that. The other times when they try to be nice and they don't want to be like hit me with that, they're like, they're all confused. Is, is that the pro? Is that the, showing them a balsamic, like a, a, a very wireframey, <laughs> we showed some balsamic wireframes to a customer once and the customer was like about 20 minutes into the demo or to the interview they thought what they were looking at was the app that it was it was nuts they it was like nuts after that i said you know what screw wireframes i'm just going to show you visuals and we build off of that and guess what every time i show wireframes and and or i show prototypes it's in high fidelity and everybody loves it, the stakeholder loves it, the customer loves it, and all we're talking about is things. We're not talking about design per se, you know, because, you know, that's just, <laughs> that's just how it goes. So, good point here by charles ui isn't just a visual design of screens it's the components yep states and interactions of the visual design yep so the ui portion when you're the ui portion is all that it's the interactions it's just it's all that you know so you're you're deciding you know the transitions and stuff like that you're working with developers to identify all that stuff so ui is all that stuff good point good point Maybe said, what is a must-haves for my portfolio for a design for a design marketing portfolio? Sorry, bad wording is my point. No word. Uh, I've read some, I read that some companies don't care about how much of a portfolio full of mock-ups and brand packages. Yes. So here's a good point. Excuse me. Um, 
Let me uh, show my screen. So let's go over to Dribble really quick. I, I, I get what you're saying. So, so for, let me just say brand packaging. Yeah, 100%. So if I was, if I, as a UX designer, if I had this on my portfolio, it wouldn't benefit the discipline then which I'm applying for. A UX designer is not necessarily going to be doing stuff like this. So definitely you have to, um, this happens a lot with um, uh, brand packaging and logos, you know, stuff like this, like even icons, like this is nice, but as a, as a, as a UI, as a product designer, it's, this is not valuable to a VP. Okay. I can, don't spend time showcasing this because this to me, I, as a, as a V, as a leader, a product leader, I can go out there and spend 10 bucks and purchase this particular icon set. So if you spent time trying to sell me on your value and your ability to design icons and logos, it doesn't mean anything to me as a product designer. Okay. Um, so yeah, so if you're doing this stuff, and you're a product designer and this is the, you have this stuff on your portfolio, this is amazing. This is great for like agency work and you're trying to get a job as a graphic designer or an illustrator at, a, at an agency, that's where that comes in. But um, for somebody who needs to, you know, design screens and work with developers and communicate and all that stuff, like problem solve, like as a, U, like a UX designer, this stuff is not, um, it's not, not going to benefit you per se. And so, I used to do this stuff back in the day because I was a graphic designer. Back, I started as graphic design and I used to do logos. I have videos. One of my most popular videos on YouTube is how to design a logo, you know? And so it was silly me. I didn't know what I was doing, but it was, it was one of my most popular videos. And um, long story short, once I realized, oh, this stuff is not needed in the jobs that I'm going for, I stopped showing them on my portfolio. So, um, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be smart about that. But if I was going into, um, if I was going into an agency, I always wanted to work for a huge ink. I always wanted to work for this company. I just years ago, 10 plus years ago, I followed this company, huge ink for some reason. And I always wanted to apply. I wanted to work there. I don't know why I just, I just loved their work. Um, back in the day, I used to always, um, look at their stuff and, um, you know, um, I just never had the skills to work there. Um, never had the right, the right design skills and I wasn't the right fit, I guess, for the culture. But, um, yeah, my, my design style, my design skills weren't really up to this level, but I always admire their work. And, um, but if I was going, if I was trying to get a job at an agency like this, obviously I would look at their stuff and go, maybe I should do some packaging. Maybe I should do some, some UI work and some, some, some high level, you know, you know, billboard type of stuff, you know, some art direction type of stuff. But, you know, that's not what I go for. I go for like product design work, you know, SaaS products and other stuff. So you got to be, you got to be in line with, with, with what you're going for. So I've created a website for, um, let's see this one. So I've created a website for clients in the past, but didn't create wireframes. Can I retroactively create wireframes for those? Yes. Uh, straight up, I did this. I, I totally did this. So what you're asking is if you just did like some, you went straight to the visual design, to high fidelity mock-up or designs, you did some stuff and it worked out. But in your portfolio, you want to show you want to kind of like show the people want to see the process and that I totally did that. So I always work in high fidelity. And so anytime you see wireframes from the stuff that I've done, it's because technically I kind of like finished the work and then I'm like, let me show them, let me fake it. Let me show some wireframes or some sketches and stuff like that. And, um, that's just part of the process. So yeah, definitely. If, if that's your process, if, if nobody needs to know, because 
straight up. If you um, trust me, I worked at ADP for five years. Um, I managed. I, I worked at a portion of ADP time and labor management software where that particular software that I worked on with customers that brought in close to a billion dollars that particular package a billion dollars of, of ADP's total 11 billion dollars of revenue so I, I, I could say literally that I worked on an app that was worth a billion dollars in revenue to ADP long story short when we worked on these apps we didn't build wireframes we just build mock-up because we already had a predefined visual design system anyway. We had a design system and so we had elements to pull from. So anytime we design new screens, there was no need to do wireframes. We already knew what the button was going to look like. We already knew what, you know, and so our, our leaders, our, our, our leaders in the companies, we had the design system for years. And so, they, if they saw a vision, if they saw a wireframe, like what the hell is that? Why do you need to do that? We already know what it's gonna look like. Just show me the, the high fidelity stuff. And so, for all our our, our our time there, there was no wireframes going on. There was no user personas. We already knew who the users were. You know, basically, three weeks into joining the company, I knew who our user base was. You know, yeah, we did have some some cool some cool PDFs of like. A couple of our our, our um, users, but we kind of knew who they were. We we knew who they who they were. HR folks, um, you know, average age forty five to sixty five. You know, fifty five using our apps. Um, you know, some folks, some millennials using apps in in certain areas, but for the most part, we knew. Long story short is you don't have to always have those things just to know. It's all common sense. A few more questions. Thanks for all the questions and stuff. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, so basically, this is a great question because there are so many titles of like a designer or like interaction designer, product designer, UI designer, UX designer, user experience designer, senior UX designer, uh, UX design lead. All of them are the same thing. You're just a designer. Essentially, the actual company probably don't know the difference between them, but you probably might have to educate them. Just go in knowing that there's only two roles. Okay, no matter what you call them, there's a researcher. Actually, I was going to a comp I was getting out. I, I had an interview. Okay, so so hear, hear this. I had an interview, and about five minutes, seven minutes into the interview, the person was asking me for data analytics of some research that I've done, and I actually had to educate that person that I'm not a researcher. I don't do data analytics, or I don't have any documentation on any research that I've ever done at any point in my career. I said, I think you're probably mistaking me for a researcher. And that person was like, oh, they were confused because they were like, oh, because uh, we need, um, we need, we need, uh, I think she was, she was the recruiter, but she was the in-house recruiter. And she was saying, well, it's sh saying, it's showing here on this paper that they want to see documentation of like your research and your analytics. And I said, in my 20 years in designing, I've never had any documentation or analytics. Um, I said, you're probably mistaking me for a researcher. So I think if this position is for a researcher, you have the wrong, I think the wrong discipline. And we kind of like casually kind of like said, you know, just reach out to me if, if, you know, if that was a mistake. The person reached out to me like two days, a day later and was like, you're right, actually, you're you're right this i was reading something for a ux researcher and um, they came back so technically i had to educate that person on who they were hiring you know now honestly in my earlier in my day if i was a young if i was not as experienced as i am i probably would have faked it and probably thought like oh man they're asking me a product product designer needs some documentation or needs some research and analytics of, of usability studies and stuff like that so i'm like no i 
I, I work with UX researchers. And so um, when you work with UX researchers, I'll, I'll share this nugget too. Let me share this nugget. When you work with UX researchers, I'm sure anybody out there has worked with UX researchers, you know this, but um, so if you, if you search with UX researcher, most times when you're doing like usability studies or interviews, the, um, the UX researcher is mostly conducting the interview. Conducting interviews. So here's the client. Okay, and here is, here, here I am, product designer. So there's a name for this. So I'm always, when I'm on this, let's say we're all three of us. One, two, three. We're all on a call together, okay? Let's say we're all on a call. This person is, the UX researcher is conducting the interview with this person, and I'm over here, I'm the observer observer basically I'm taking notes and I love this role because I can sit there and really study and analyze what the user is doing I love I always love this role I I rarely love doing the interviews themselves because when you're doing the interviews, you're having to re focus on the structure of the interview, making sure you're asking the right questions. A lot of times when I sit back quietly and I just observe, I'm listening to what the UX researcher is saying and then what the, how the clients ant like ask like following up on that question or sometimes the UX researcher is like leading the user on i'm like jesus you this researcher is inexperienced like why are you leading the customer on you can't lead them on you have to ask questions and kind of let them figure it out and you know kind of like lead you 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 kind of like have to know what you're doing like you can't really like ask leading questions or things that might influence the client when you're doing a usability study and so what happens is i like to observe and so a lot of times when i observe that's when I get the most input. It's like honest feedback. Like when I literally watch a customer try to complete a task, I can pinpoint everything that they're clicking on, everything they're clicking on, these drop things. And I'm like, wow, seven out of 10 users clicked on this particular drop down button when they should have been clicking over here. Those are the things I'm picking up as an observer. And so just remember that point. Be sure to call that out like, I always tell people in my interviews, like I've worked with researchers, but I'm always the observer. This is where I kind of can pinpoint and, and kind of really study the user and really, um, you know, get the most benefit from, you know, these usability studies and stuff like that. But if somebody needed me to conduct the interviews, I can conduct the interviews as well. So that's that. Let me see. Yeah, product designer, the product designer name. That's not been experienced as much more. Companies hire different designers with knowledge of different disciplines. Um, I guess. Designers of different disciplines. I mean, are you, are you thinking? Are you saying like Google hires like a illustrator or an interaction designer? That's 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 Google. Trust me, that's Google. Google has a billion dollars to play with, and so they're just trying to find people that do different. That Google is not every company. Trust me. When you there's only two designers, there's only two types of designers in ninety nine percent of the roles. There's a researcher. And there's a designer. Okay, it's a question here. Is portfolio must? Yes. Could you get hired without a portfolio? Sure. Great question, Garrett.
Hey Mike, do you offer any coaching for native advertising for Taboola? I don't know what that is. I thought you were saying, do I offer any coaching? Yes, I'm starting to offer one-on-one -on -one coaching. I'm going to have my page up soon where you can go and sign up and, and apply for one-on-one -on -one coaching. But I thought you were asking about one-on-one -on -one coaching. That I do have. And I've been doing one-on-one -on -one coaching. A lot of people hear me say this in different videos and stuff like that. And so they reach out to me. Um, if you are interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching with me, just go to my site, MLUX Academy use a contact link and just mention in the link or you can email me um, but just go to that site mluxacademy.com the link is in the description use a contact link reach out to me hey Mike I heard you mention one-on-one -on -one coaching you know I'm interested and then we can really set up a, a time to, to kind of mesh I appreciate that appreciate that Chan um, last question I like Victor said, I'm a straight up high fidelity guy. Straight up. That's it. Go high fidelity. None of that wireframe stuff. If you're interviewing candidates for UXR position, what kind of interview question? See, now I think that's um, UXR. Um, somebody mentioned this to me. I don't really know what that term is. It, um, art of, I don't know what UXR R, R means. Is that. Um, um, what does somebody, somebody, somebody said something about UXR last time. I don't know what that is. It's something that I, I don't deal with. Is it, um, let me see, what is UXR? User research. Is that what that is? Oh, UX researcher. Oh, duh. Um, so, so if you're saying, um, so let me get back to the question again. Chan was saying, if you were interviewing candidates for a user research position, what kinds of interview questions would you ask? I think um, uh, that's a good question. I'm not an expert UX researcher. Um, there's a, there's a, but that's a good question. I, I think definitely UX research position. I, I think UX research interviews are much harder than design interviews. I think UX research, you really have to go deep into, you know, your human computer interaction knowledge and your psychology knowledge of your understanding of, uh, you know, usability studies and how you research and what do you look for and what's the benefits of what you look for and what, what's the value and things and how do you approach UX design or research, do you look to validate? Do you look for, you know, different, you know, you know, places to go within the market? Do you propose ideas? What do you look? All these different things for when it comes to UX research. And I'm not an expert at UX research. I just I take a common sense approach. I try to my my approach in designing products is very straightforward. Very Base, very, very down to earth, very common. Can we produce a great product for this company? That's what we as product designers are here for. And how I approach that, I think visual design is important because it keeps that product current um, and on the cutting edge. Um, that's a real statement because ADP was lacking when I first got there and they, the VPs, the CEOs of ADP said that they came back and came back to us when they were building out their UX team. They said, these younger companies, these younger startups are out there eating our lunch because they look better, they can move faster because we're a big ship and they're like an agile little yacht. They, they look better. The, the, they get more oohs and ahs when they're presenting their screens on stage versus our, our screens. But we're making a billion dollars, but they're making $5 million, but they are getting the oohs and ahs. So we need to look, we need to compete with them. And so visual design is, is huge. But in addition to that, visual design, to stay on the cutting edge of things, and you know, obviously being highly featured and, and just solving customer problems. And um, you know, 
relationships in, in, an, in an organization. Those are the core, core valuable things that a product designer brings to any organization. Anyway, uh, wifey's hitting me up and I got to gone over an hour. But anyway, guys, I appreciate you guys for, um, for, for chatting with me on this live um, and uh, asking questions. And I hope to answer some questions, got some nuggets. If you, again, if you want to know more about things that I, I teach and, and, and um, want to speak with me one-on-one, -on -one, visit my site, MLUX Academy. Click on the link there. It's in the description. Hit me up. Use the contact link there. Also, you can always um, uh, link with me on um, uh, LinkedIn. Connect with me on LinkedIn. You can always send me... Anybody who actually asks for a friend invite on LinkedIn, I'm accepting it. And then you can always respond to me on LinkedIn. I get messages there and uh, I love those messages and I always respond to people on LinkedIn as well. Anyway, guys, thanks a lot for watching and uh, more to come. All right. Thanks, guys. See you, Gary.